That summer is still really vivid in my memory. I remember as the fires were coming, breathing really thick smoke and ash um, as, as they were approaching the house. I was under the house doing last minute preparations before I evacuated to safety. These fires were something we've never seen before. It was a real slap in the face from climate change that we were seeing here. Apart from being fuel driven, they were also weather driven fires. Areas that have been burnt just months before burnt again in these fires. We had weather systems created. I remember driving down the highway as I was evacuating my house and seeing three fire weather systems in different directions as I left. And we had long droughts and extreme heat driving these fires and it was, it's pretty terrifying to watch to see such massive areas get consumed by these fires. We had mega fires um, across this Blue Mountains World Heritage area. We had a huge fire in the north that had been coming for weeks, another big fire in the south. Fortunately, I didn't lose my home. I was one of the lucky people. Uh, the firefighters here were amazing. We had 23 fire trucks, two helicopters and a big 737 water bomber um, ready to fight this fire by the time it got close to me. The fires grew across this World Heritage area and was starting to consume all of these areas we love and including the wildlife we love. We've been studying koalas in this area for many years now and we had radio tracked a bunch of them. We knew their names, you know, we knew their habits and it was horrible watching as these fires slowly consume the areas they were living in. Australia is familiar with fires, they're part of our landscape, but these were fires of a scale and intensity we've never seen before. We were getting horrible stories from the fire grounds. I know to the south of here, people were talking about death fields where they were walking out, seeing skeletons of, of dead animals on the ground. And when they touched the bones, they just crumbled into ash as if they'd been cremated. To the north of here, we had reports of 70 metre flame heights as this fire approached from the Gospers Mountain Fire. That turned out to be a mega fire, several fires joined up, and it's the largest single ignition forest fire in Australia's history. We had a similar massive fire to the south, which was created by about three different fires joining up called the Green Wattle Creek Fire. And both of those fires were encroaching towards the center, one from the north, one from the south, coming towards this ridge line of, of human settlements. The Greater Blue Mountains World Heritage Area is one million hectares, so about 2.5 million acres in size, made up of eight different national parks and reserves. And 80% of that was hit by fire. It's a magical wilderness area and these fires were really personal. Apart from the fact that we live here and we love the place, we've been studying koalas in this region for six years now. And it's a really special area. Nobody really thought that they existed here in big numbers. It's sandstone country and koalas are pretty famous for liking good soil types. So they often live around people because we also like those good soil types to grow food um, and to grow our gardens in. So often they're under threats from development. Whereas we've got this massive protected area where koalas weren't thought to exist. Um, but for us, we were finding this real story of hope with koalas. We were finding them in areas nobody thought they lived using tree species that nobody thought they could use and we've just discovered basically they're a bunch of rule breaking koalas they haven't read the literature on how koalas are supposed to behave one of the theories is a climate envelope where koalas are supposed to occur 800 meters and below we found them at 1100 meters altitude up in Canangra Boyd National Park where it snows in winter so a few months before those fires hit these koalas were sitting in snow the other thing that makes these koalas really unique and in fact nationally significant is we did a big collaborative study looking at the genomics of koalas right across the species range and we tested koalas from South Australia right up north to far north Queensland and the most genetically diverse population in the country is the Blue Mountains koalas. So we had a really amazing story of hope here. We've got koalas inside a protected area where they're not facing development threats, so loss of habitat, domestic dogs and vehicle strikes are all common threats to koalas. We had koalas inside a national park system protected from those sorts of threats, highly diverse and we even found a koala population that was free of chlamydia, which is a disease that hits koala populations um, significantly in a lot of areas of Australia, it will kill the koalas. 
Um, it's a fairly common disease and it affects them at different levels. Some will survive, but it's, it basically can lead to population decline. And we found this population up in the snow line that was disease free as well as genetically diverse and safe from development threats. So a fairly unique story of hope. Koalas are listed as a threatened species in Australia. After these fires, people are actually trying to get them listed as an endangered species. In New South Wales alone, we lost about 30% of koala habitats during these fires. We couldn't get in to most areas. It's really remote, rugged, steep country out here and everybody felt really helpless. So constantly we were watching this fires near me out, thinking, what can we do? One of the key problems here was that at that time we had a hundred fires burning across the state or more. And so all of the resources we had had to go to protecting human life and property. Therefore, nothing was available to protect wildlife. So the fires that started inside the national park system had to be left to burn because they were too remote and hard to put out. So those fires grew and then joined up and made these massive mega fires. And so out of that came this desperation to try and do something. And I floated what I thought was a bit of a crazy idea at the time. Um, no one had done it. Normally you can't pull out healthy animals from the wild without a, a lot of due process. You know, you have to get permits and scientific licenses and all sorts of things to consider something like that. But in these circumstances, everybody in the National Parks and Wildlife Service was watching everything burn as well and feeling helpless. And so I floated this idea, can we go in in front of one of these fires and try and pull some of these koalas out? And to my surprise, nobody said no. Everybody said, let me get back to you. I'll just talk to someone else. And in the end, we got support from National Parks and Wildlife Service. It was a huge operation to pull together in a couple of days and undertake. I had teams of experienced volunteers who are off-track remote area hikers who've been helping us collect our research data. It's part of our community engagement. We had radio tracking collars on these koalas. So I had two tracking teams going out, walking off into the remote area to find these koalas. I had another team of people going out in a search and rescue line, scouring the canopy to see if we could get more koalas out that we didn't have tags on. I got a specialist capture team up from interstate to come and help catch the koalas. We had a two-day window where the fire was approaching, but the conditions were good to go in and pull out some koalas and take them to the zoo. And it was, I mean, it was a great thing to do. Everybody thought, well, at least we've saved something. Um, and if all of their habitat goes, at least we've got a good gene pool to start from as well. We took them to Taronga Zoo, who set up some enclosures for us. They had to be kept in a really special area because they were disease free and didn't want any sort of cross contamination. And then we had to feed them, which was a huge amount of work. And our volunteer army was amazing. We actually had 140 new volunteers sign up during the fires to help. Um, and a lot of our core volunteers help with what we call browse collection. So the things that koalas eat, the leaves are called browse. We had to transport browse from around their home two and a half hours to the zoo a few times a week to keep them fed. And the zoo pitched in with local browse as well from the Sydney area, which they ended up loving because it had a lot more moisture in it. You know, with the fires and the heat up here, it wasn't very palatable to them. So it was a massive operation. We were really delighted to get a dozen koalas out. That was all the zoo could hold and browse was a really limiting factor, but it was, it was really satisfying to do something. We had to keep them in the zoo for three months. Following the fires, we call it the apocalyptic summer here, actually. We had, because we had drought to start with, then we had these massive fires, then we had floods, and then we had pestilence in the form of COVID-19. After the fires came these flooding rains, which sadly washed a lot of the ash beds, which are nutrient rich down into the waterways and contaminated them. But that same rain eventually helped restore the bush and the canopy condition improved. So the, the food improved again in the, in the burnt areas and in the unburnt areas. So we monitored that really closely to decide when we could put those koalas back. Immediately after the fires, our next major concern was trying to find and help any animals that had survived the fires and had been burnt or injured by them. So we did a lot of search and rescue work and that included using our detection dog Smudge um, and his handler Kim. We got out into the, the fire zones around the edges and any point we could access and use the dog to help find fresh koala scat and look up to find koalas that were injured to take them to safety. The other really big threat was if these animals had survived the fire, they were now facing loss of food, so all of their food sources had been burnt, and also dehydration from the drought. So this was before the floods had hit. So during that time, this is when our army of 140 volunteers came into play. We started designing, building, and making water stations to get out in the bush for, for koalas, but also using them as a flagship species and putting food and water resources out into wherever these koalas occurred to help multiple species. 
So we did two different types of water stations, um, ones that we call arboreal, that we put up trees so that koalas and gliders and possums can access them. We don't want those animals having to come to ground for water because one of the big threats here in Australia is invasive predators. So we've got foxes um, and feral cats that kill our native wildlife and they can have a bit of a field day. When the fires have come through and there's no understory to protect our smaller animals, then the predators can do really well. We also put water on the ground for a bunch of species, including macropods like wallabies and kangaroos and wombats as well. And we put out pellets as food drops as well to give them a safe supply of food. So these fires really inspired a lot of people to action. We were really grateful to get a lot of support during this time. So we had never done this work before. We typically do research and then get that information out to make sure that wildlife conservation is really effective. Because of the extremity of this situation, we found ourselves doing animal welfare work, so search and rescue, food and water drops. We had no funding for any of this work, so we ran fundraising appeals and we had overwhelming support. And even San Diego Zoo, our core partner in the US, raised a lot of funds for us as well to help during the fires and after. So after these flooding rains, fortunately the rains continued and the bush started to bounce back. So we looked at putting these rescued koalas back home. The fire had been stopped right in the middle of where we took them from. So they were in a low intensity burn zone, but there was also a patch of bush to the north that was unburnt. So we'd been monitoring the conditions there. We got out and did a bunch of surveys to make sure that they could survive if we put them back there, that there was enough food for them. To our delight, we'd done pouch checks on the females when we caught them and one of them didn't have a young when she went into the zoo, but she'd obviously already conceived. And so we took 12 koalas out and we put 13 back, which was some really nice news. That then brought our, our final challenge, which has affected the rest of the world as well. COVID-19 was kicking in around that time. I had these plans to do a really staggered release to, to gradually put these koalas back and monitor them as we went. But COVID-19 was hitting, the shutdowns were coming. And so having rushed to get these koalas out in front of the fire, we then had to rush to put them back um, before COVID-19 stopped us from doing so. We certainly didn't want them stuck in the zoo. One of the key risks there, although they were fit and healthy when they went in, they can lose condition and, and their ability to climb. They're used to climbing really big trees and obviously they're much better if they get to select their own food. So we wanted to get them back out as soon as it was safe. And so we had this, again, a narrow window of opportunity to get them out from the zoo and back up into Kanangra Boyd where they belonged. So we had to get a a hazardous tree assessor in as part of this work. One of the things that was really limiting people's access to the fire zones to help wildlife was the fact it wasn't safe to go in. Trees often come down after fire. And so all of the make safe teams, as they're called, were out working around communities and trying to get people back on their feet. Again, there was nothing really available for wildlife. So I ended up hiring our own arborist who would go in in front of our field teams and do hazardous tree assessments. So once he'd established safe access for our teams, then we were able to go in, set up some temporary fences so that we could monitor the koalas for 24 hours and ensure that they could still climb and that they were eating okay. Um, and we put collars back on them so that we could radio track them. And now a big focus of our work is following these koalas in the wild, in the burn zone, to see how they survive and also which habitats they use because we're getting signs of hope from these koalas that they are using the burn zones of different fire intensities. And by finding out where they prefer and, and the conditions under which they can survive, those are the places we can then go and look for more koalas. So our next steps after the fires are to do really broad scale surveys. We're trying to cover a huge area, probably do about 500 surveys to try and figure out where we've got these little pockets of hope, these little refuges where koalas have survived. It might be in the really steep gullies where the trees are huge and the fire just trickled through. Um, it could be in certain habitat types, different slopes and aspects or different tree species as well. So we're trying to find if there's any common characteristics that we can say, well, that's a fire refuge for koalas and other species. We need to try and protect that in the long term, because one of the really scary things about these fires is we can expect to see this again. You know, this is the first step under a change in climate. We're expecting more frequent and more intense fires. So we really need to change how we manage out of this. 
And the first thing we need to do is understand what we need to protect, if we can protect some core areas where things can recolonize from. One of the main really big concerns from these fires was the sheer scale of them. Normally fires are smaller, and so you've got a lot of patches and edges where animals can come in and recolonize from. That wasn't the case with these fires, so we need to ensure we can protect some refuge areas so that when fires come through again, those areas are protected and we have source populations that can recolonize as the habitats recover. Hopefully um, where we and this jury oh, went in is a little so patchy, yeah. so yeah. probably first view of the big forest. Yeah, yeah. home rather than a, a little it's zoo enclosure. Yeah, wow. so but mum's planning beautifully well, she's, you know, jumping, Swap changing it. branches, leaping yeah. about, so she's a good one, they're both good sport. Yeah. The other thing we're really having to focus on is we do have some surviving koalas from these populations where they went to the developed zone. So we've got a lot of koalas that were living in the national park, but they were also living around people's properties. And because that was an asset protection zone that was protected during the fires, that's where a lot of the surviving animals are. So those areas that are subject to development and land clearing and threats like vehicle collisions and domestic dog attacks, we need to really focus our resources down there to protect those animals because they could well be the ones that recolonize these protected areas. Koalas sadly are really susceptible to fire, so they became a bit of an ambassador for the impact of these fires on wildlife here in Australia. Their response to fire is to climb higher in the tree. So they're not like a kangaroo or a wallaby where they can run away or a wombat where they can go underground and might take shelter. Koalas are really susceptible to fire and the fires we just had a lot of the time were what we call crowning fires. So they actually burn through the canopy of the trees. And that also means that over the long term, some of those really intensely burnt areas are going to take a very long time to recover. A lot of those trees are dead once the canopy is completely obliterated by fire. They don't necessarily bounce back. And so that's why they've become the face of these fires and why we've potentially lost so many koalas. And we're going to have to work really hard to see if we can get them to bounce back after a catastrophic event like this. So we've got two big jobs ahead of us now. It's going to be a long road to recovery from these fires. And that is finding the surviving animals in the protected area and working out how we can protect them and recover those populations long term. And really focusing more resources into those developed areas as well to protect the koalas that we have left. The other thing about koalas is they get a lot of moisture from the leaves. Normally they don't drink water unless it's a really bad heat wave. You might have seen famous photos of koalas drinking from a bottle. That's actually a really rare thing. Normally they get all the moisture they need from the foliage they eat. And so part of the work we're doing in terms of our surveys is trying to figure out which areas are going to be suitable under climate change where koalas can still get the moisture they need to survive in the long term so that we can make sure that these populations persist into the future. As part of the survey work we're going to be doing to try and find these surviving koalas, our detection dog team is going to be really important. So we've got Smudge at the moment, who's a coolie, who's fully trained and ready to deploy. We've also got Groot, my new border collie pup, who's a year old now, and in another six months he should be pretty ready to go. Groot started really early with his training at just a few months old. He, he had some really good talents and, and good temperament, which is what he was selected for. He did a fetch at eight weeks old, so he's very ball focused, which is the reward. And we're putting in a lot of training to get him up to speed to, to get him out in the bush and help him with this work as soon as possible. The dogs are really important because koalas in the Blue Mountains can be really hard to find. The forests are really tall and the canopy can be really thick. So you can't just walk through the bush and look up and hope to see a koala, which is why we've focused on trying to find their poop or scat. So we use our detection dog teams to locate the scat. Then we know the koalas are around and where to focus our search areas as well. So we're going to be using the dogs because they're far more effective at finding koalas that are in low densities. You know, we know that we've lost a lot of koalas, probably a thousand koalas or more, or more just in the Blue Mountains. And the dogs are going to be really important in helping us to find whatever's left, um, particularly low density patches where there's not a lot of koalas around. So it's going to be a very long road to recovery after these fires and we're just not resourced for it at this point in time. Training a dog, for example, takes about $20,000 to just to get a dog up to speed and ready to work. We've got, apart from trying to blitz these surveys out in the next 12 months and cover as many sites as we can all in one hit, we then want to do long-term monitoring because if we find koalas and we put some management actions in place, we need to make sure that they're effective and that these populations are recovering and not declining. So it's going to be a long road and a lot of work and we really appreciate any support we can get. We'd love your help. Thank you.